Hey, thanks for joining me. X-Force number 11. Um, no one can deny the uh, mega power force cultural juggernaut that was X-Force at the time. But Liefeld's departure certainly left the, uh, it, the interest in the book. I imagine people had to think that, like, can you maintain this? I think there were probably people in creative control that would say that it doesn't matter if Liefeld's not running it. It's the characters. It's Marvel. It's our creative direction. It's not the one guy who kind of spearheaded this whole thing that's important. And for all the shit I give Liefeld, you cannot deny the importance that he car that he had and the weight that he carried with this book. And the story, uh, as I've been talking about, as we've reviewed X-Force, at the time, I was very much interested in it. I was invested in these characters. It's um, The story's a little bit haphazard and kind of going all over the place and dragging on. But as a kid, I was way invested. And when Liefeld left, it just wasn't the same. Now, we were all excited because he's going off to do Youngblood. And in theory, that was going to be amazing. And it wasn't. But... X-Force, I, you know, I, I was still interested because they were connected to the X-Men universe and the bigger, grander Marvel history. So, I don't know. I was a little bit more invested upon retro retrospect and reflection. I was more interested in the X-Force characters. And, um, I don't know. I, I, it was a very interesting time in comics. Um, the last issue, 10, was the first issue where Liefeld is not drawing it anymore. It was a Mark Pacella. But you could also say Liefeld was pretty much checked out at least one or two issues before that because his art's in there, but it's very rushed, very rough, and being finished off by, I believe, Dan Panosian on inks. Um, so it, it kind of had a little bit of Liefeld's flavor, but not quite the same. But uh, last issue 10, uh, again, Mark Pacella drew it, and he also drew the cover. But this cover right here, this is, I'm guessing, I think... The last time Liefeld does X-Force in his original Marvel run. He's obviously come back to Deadpool and the X-Force characters a couple times in recent years. But as far as his original run, this cover is the last thing that he did. So it's kind of like a couple issues ago is his last interior work. And then he didn't get the cover on the last issue, but he got the cover here. And as I stare at it, I remember thinking when I first got this as a kid, and even kind of now, there's something about it that's just appealing and eye-catching, even though I stare at it and I just see all these ridiculous things that are wrong and weird. I mean, starting with the good, I mean, it's Liefeld, so it's got, it says Liefeld and then Scott down here. Now, i got to mention this. Um, I don't know anything for an absolute fact in some ways. But once Liefeld got over to Image Comics and he started up Brigade, he had Murat Michaels drawing that. The, his buddy, his younger kid friend, um, drawing Brigade, which I did a whole video on the original Brigade miniseries. It's terrible. But there was an inker named Paul Scott. And um, Liefeld put in the back of, the, I think it was the first issue, talking about how... Marat's the first rookie of Image Comics and bringing along with him is this new inker, Paul Scott, who helped, both of them helped him on his X-Force run. And this is probably maybe the only one in time that that happened. Who is this Paul Scott? It's nobody but Rob Liefeld. It's just a bullshit name that he made up. And I didn't know that until someone else pointed it out. Now, if I have my information wrong. Of course, I'm very much happy to have any kind of clarification that people want to throw out there. But I feel like Liefeld threw this on here so he could say this new guy, Paul Scott, was helping me on X-Force. And then he's immediately on Youngblood, Liefeld is, and then this Paul Scott, who's just Liefeld as an inker. It was suggested that Liefeld created this separate persona so when he inks over someone else like a like a Marat Michaels it doesn't say it doesn't say Liefeld so therefore it's not trying to like take the spotlight away from Marat for example because if Liefeld's name's on it that's what people are going to see that's what I was 
told or I read. I, I, I It sounds plausible, but it's just interesting that Liefeld's got this Scott name on here. And it's bullshit. It's just him. And I do like it because this looks like Liefeld giving it his all and doing the best that he can do. The composition is energetic. You got Deadpool and kind of this crazy weird pose of him flexing coming this way, fighting against Domino, her kind of jumping and the arm extended, and then Shatterstar kind of tucked under their asses here. I feel like it shouldn't work, but it does. There's energy and movement. The 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 breakdown of the color and the costumes and the skin tones and things like that give them a very clear separation in in clarity and in, in each who each character is. I wish Shatterstar was in his goddamn regular outfit, that like white billowy shirt and cape. Um, I don't know why he's just running around in spandex and straps on his bare ass skin. It's kind of dumb. And I mean, there's an actual perspective going on with this technological room they're in, probably the danger room. Um, did Liefeld do this? I mean, probably, maybe. Um, it's just basically finding an anchor point and then just getting your lines up like this and then just start doing some boxy shapes to make it look like a technological wall. And then the coloring's kind of odd, just yellow. But it kind of stands out. It kind of works. And I, I actually like it. So, as again, like I was saying... This is as good as Liefeld can do in this era. And I've, I've said through all the X-Force reviews, my favorite work from Liefeld is his X-Force work. Despite all its flaws, the inking, his, his um, inking with like a Hunt 102 um, and him inking himself with the inking tool like this, this just looks, this is the best version of him. Once he gets over to Image Comics, he quickly adopts other inkers and his work just gets just everything that's wrong with it just becomes amplified tenfold and everything that Liefeld can actually do good gets lost and I saw you know I've spent enough time on this cover I guess but this is him at his best his last cover for his first run on X-Force I I mean I dig it I dig it now, uh, in the last issue I was talking about, we had Mark Pacella taken over. And it's a guy who is adopting the ridiculous, over-the-top kind of styling that Liefeld brought to popular attention. And he's really lacking in a lot of skills. But he also has a lot of things that he can do well that Liefeld cannot. Like... This panel, so, I mean, the story is, I mean, what's funny is this story that's going on, it feels like it's the same day, but it's been going back since issue five, I think, and this is 11, where X-Force is just hanging out and doing training or something like that, um, like Shatterstar and Warpath were fighting each other, training, and... Then they, the, uh, the X, the X mansion, I almost said the X force team, they get attacked by the Morlocks. And I think that was issue five when that started. We're on issue 11 and we're still dealing with that same storyline. And it, it hasn't even been 24 hours. I don't think it's really ridiculous that this one storyline is still going on. As I've been reviewing the uh, classic X Men issues, the Claremont and Burns stuff, with the the like the Dark Phoenix storyline, I'm constantly talking about how I'm shocked at how much story they can put into 17 pages, and then we have the same storyline going on for like six issues. It's it's kind of silly, anyway. But to just bring up the storyline to make context make sense, Cable's decided to go take the bodies of some of the Morlocks that attacked them and I guess drop them off to the Morlocks to like, he wants the Morlocks to know like, you don't fuck with X-Force. If you do, this is what happens. Cause Cable's pissed. That's the kind of, uh, that's the kind of the vibe that I get from the characters. This, all this shit went down and a bunch of bad things happened. 
and Cable is not having it. He's pretty damn mad. Um, Cannonball got stabbed and should have died, but he's still alive because he's an external. They're suggesting he can live forever. So they're going down these dark tunnels. You got uh, Warpath back here carrying a couple of bodies. Boomer saying this is completely disgusting. Cannonball saying, you sure we have to go through with this Cable? And then Cable himself, even though there's no pointer going to him, it says, image is everything, Sam. Um, that's kind of a cool picture of Cable. But part of me feels like I've seen that somewhere before. So I wonder if it's a lift from something. Um, and so then we cut to, here's the team. They're coming down this extremely sheer cliff face. And for some reason under the sun, I can't understand. Like there's this, you pr again, you probably can't see it very well through the camera here, but there's a screen tone added to this rocky face that goes from dark and it fades out. Maybe they did this because they wanted to make sure that these monster heads were visible. I just, I don't see the need for the rocky, uh, the, the screen tone coming down on this rocky face as these dark silhouette shapes come down the this hillside here. But what I was getting at is Pacella for being not a great artist. I feel like he, I don't know, he has the potential to become a better version of Rob Liefeld because he draws in that same ridiculous art style that Liefeld brings to the fore, but he can actually draw other things. These monster faces, these bug eyes and these mouths, this mouth, these teeth, these big old ears, like all these weird creature designs. I got to be honest, like Liefeld can't do that. You know, that's just, it's not something Liefeld can do. That's not bad. It's just, it's unfortunate that it's kind of drenched in this ridiculous, like, cross-hatching, like putting lines all over places. Like you see other artists put lines here, but you don't know why they're doing it or how it makes it work. So you just start mimicking it. It's like, oh, there's a shoulder. So I'm going to put like a shadowy line and then cross-hatch it down from it. The idea is supposed to imply like a, a round surface and then a shadow starting, and then you're just kind of cross-hatching it for a fade. But you really have to understand form to make that work right. And he doesn't. I also appreciate the color change because Cable, you know, they're in the dark and then he lights up a torch so the coloring works really well. And now why Cable is standing up against like a flat concrete wall with like bullet holes in it, that doesn't seem to fit the setting that they were in here. Well, what the fuck do I know? So a big splash page of Cable. He's screaming at the Morlocks. He says, Morlocks, hear me? Mask is dead. Do any of you want to join your fallen leader? So I guess his evidence that Mask is dead is to bring his tattered ass cloak. Why not bring his like head? Can you imagine Cable holding up Mask's severed head right here? Marvel would never have the fucking balls to do that, but that would be awesome. And again, for Pacella, it's kind of not a bad face and the open screamy mouth. And he's he's got a little bit, he's got a better understanding of anatomy. He's just pushing it into Liefeld territory. Um, interesting, Rob Liefeld plot. So the basic story, I mean, he's been driving the narrative of these books. So even if he's off to Image Comics to go do Youngblood, his basic plots are still in place, driving it for at least a couple issues. Fabian Nicieza script, Mark Pacella guest pencils, Dan Panosian on inks. So basically the same as last issue. Oh yeah, and Cable got in a fight with Farrell's sister, her name is Thorn, and she ripped her claws across his face to reveal that he's got cybernetic face under, at least on this half of his body. Um, Terminator 2 is a big deal at the time. This is June of 92, it says here. So I'm sure that factored into it some. Uh, but, I mean, we always knew Cable had a robotic arm, but how far did it go? And honestly, we didn't know that it, like he would have this robotic face and have the skin ripped off it and to reveal like robotic cyborg underneath. It was a little bit of a shock at the time. Um, so Cable continues, says, X-Force does not blame the general Morlock population for the actions of your leaders, but this serves as a final warning. Sauron is dead. Mask is den, dead. Thorn beaten and whipped. And that's kind of like compositionally this works. You got monsters, creatures, 
cable standing here. Like it reads pretty damn clear, whether the drawings are kind of not that great, but they're not, they're not terrible. I remember thinking they used to be terrible because it's not Liefeld. I was very big into him at the time, but this Pacella, he's got the inklings of a better understanding. I also like, again, the coloring, this guy in this darker, cool hue to indicate he's back here farther and then cable with his torch and then the lighting, you know, illuminating all these figures up front. And I guess, again, there's this random concrete wall with bullet holes in it that he's standing behind. So at least visual continuity. Thank you. And Sauron, that damn lizard that we've been dealing with in the comic for since, like, what was it, again, issue five or six? And he's dead? I guess. And then Thorn, bullshit, like, kitty lady, who is Farrell's sister. And the Cable makes a point to shout out. He's like, one person you thought was a casualty of war, Cannonball, lives, breathes, and walks among us. So tell us, boys and girls, what's the lesson we learned here today? Again, not a not a bad cartoony comic booky 90s era face. It's not bad. Not great, not bad. <laughs> and so um Cable says, "You're better served working with me than dying against me. Remember it and live." So, I also guess you can't tell cuz there is some stuff that's really not clear. Like, I don't know where Cable's... I guess that's Cable's concrete wall he was standing in front of right there. But there's also, like, a some kind of, like, chasm between them. So Warpath throws Sauron's body across the way to at the Morlocks. And then you got Farrell and Thorn yelling at each other, having a little sister bitch fest. It ain't over between us, big sister. Name the time and place, Maria. No, Thorn, I don't think so. I'll nail your hide to the wall when you least expect it. So then Cable's like, all right, Farrell, let's move out. So awesome shot of them. Well, I mean, it's supposed to be an awesome shot of them walking away like big conquering heroes. Um, Not a great shot of them. Warpath looks terrible. I guess he decided to put his outfit on. He was running around in like little spandexy pants last I seem to remember him. And, uh, but I guess he decided to put his outfit on um, not great. Again, kind of okay, but not great. And then I guess after all the battles that X-Force just went through, Cable and his, his buddies would decide to go show off to the Morlocks. Now, Morlocks are, aren't they? Um, they're in New York, right? In like the underground of New York. But at up and, and upstate... At yeah, and upstate at X Force headquarters, located between the uh, beneath the Adriatic Mountains. I don't know. I mean, are those real mountains? And how far away from the from New York? I guess it doesn't matter. But the point I'm getting at is that after all the battles and the death and the the destruction, Cable goes off to flex at the Morlock to scare them off from attacking X Force ever again. Shatterstar just decides to just keep working out. And then there's a uh, text boxes that is not Shatterstar. Now, it's no secret who it is. It's Deadpool. He says, broke in right after Nate and his dweeb kitties took off for parts unknown, looking for Vanessa. Wasn't part of this, you know, as long as Vanessa wasn't part of the school trip. I don't care. Watching this punk Shatterstar has been kind of fun. Now, I thought this was some interesting bit of characterization, and it kind of pissed me off as a kid. I kind of was into Shatterstar. He's the super warrior badass of the team. Now, they're all kind of warrior badasses, but he's been raised since a child, genetically engineered to be the ultimate fighting machine. He's super badass. But Deadpool's observing. He says, um, watching this punk Shatterstar has been kind of fun. Non-stop for over an hour. Makes Jane Fonda looks like a couch potato. Just seeing him go, you got to admire the kid's gumption. But then Deadpool continues here. Of course, by now, I've learned at least 35 different weaknesses in his fighting technique. So, you know, this character, I'm like, this guy's supposed to be a super badass. But then this Deadpool guy who I missed in the comics, his original introduction. Um, 
I only saw him in the later kind of appearances. I, I can't remember. Was he in New Mutants 100? And then X-Force, the couple appearances. And then, of course, the design, you'd see in ads and magazines and Wizards and stuff like that. Um, you couldn't help but notice that this was a character that was kind of new and up and coming. And boy, if any of them knew what he'd become culturally over the decades. But I was kind of pissed off. Like, like Shatterstar is that easy to defeat? Like, he, they say that? No, nah, no way. Come on, Shatterstar, is, he's not going to get his ass whooped by this Deadpool clown. Um, pretty good shot of him standing here. It looks pretty intimidating. Good use of the mask. And kind of not a bad pose. Those ridiculous Liefeld swords. Like he's sticking to the design. Backgrounds are a little... Once you start trying to... Like at a glance, it reads. There he is. Sirens on the ground. He's in the control room of, of some type. But when you start looking at it, like... This is, I guess, a chair. It's just like a blocky shape with only one armrest. It doesn't have a second one. And these computer control panels are just kind of nonsensical things. It kind of works at a glance, but when you start picking away at it, you're like, well, what? Anyway, Deadpool continues here. So what do I do? I'm here to smack some sense into Vanessa, not jerk off. I mean, sorry, not jerk around with Cable's diaper brigade, but accidentally running into the Irish witch proved to be fun. And now I got a little interdimensional punk showing off for an audience he doesn't even know is watching. I thought that was a little bit of a bit of interesting characterization, how Shatterstar's Still, because he came from like a gladiatorial kind of mojo world is what it was. And uh, they were forced to fight. And he's still showing off like he's in the ring and he won. But even though, as far as he knows, no one's watching, he's still like doing a victory dance. But Deadpool's like, ah, I'm such a sucker for a good brawl. So I guess he shatters the glass of wherever he was up at looking, I guess. Some shattered glass everywhere. He's like, hey, pretty boy, cowabunga dude. Yeah, okay. And of course, Shatterstar's one of his favorite lines is Zazvid. So Deadpool, foot to the face, sending Shatterstar back. And um, he's like, Deadpool, remember? And Shatterstar's like, oh, how could I forget it, assassin? Deadpool's, rather, Shatterstar's wiping the blood from his lip, charges at Deadpool, who just jumps over him like it's no big deal. Shatterstar is saying, when last we parted, you were bound and gagged and mewling like a pup as we mailed you back to your employer. So again, Deadpool jumps over Shatterstar and sh throws him into a wall. And Deadpool says, hey, that's right. Thanks for reminding me, kid. You're making me change my mind. Instead of just roughing you up, I'm going to kill you cold. I think I've said this before. I'm going to reemphasize it. Um... Modern day Deadpool that everyone's just so gaga over. I don't really care for it. I do not like the fourth wall breaking stuff. That is not anything Liefeld had in the character. Um, Joe Kelly, I believe, is the one who added that. And he deserves credit. But I got I get sick of it real quick. I, I actually kind of am sick of Deadpool. I, I like Ryan Reynolds in the movies. And those tend to be pretty damn entertaining enough. But I like the original version of Deadpool. It was just a super badass assassin, just evil Spider-Man. But, you know, what do I know when you consider who Deadpool's become? I mean, I don't know what I'm talking about. So, Shadowstar comes charging at Deadpool. And Shadowstar says, I will enjoy seeing you try, lapdog. You honor me in a way, Deadpool. I have not had the opportunity to fight an equal in solo combat since I came to this world. So Shatterstar's swinging and punching, but he keeps missing. He says, fuck, you're fast. And Deadpool, or yeah, Deadpool says, oh yeah, pretty boy, in regards to that opportunity you're so happy about, I like how, you know, Shatterstar swings at him and Deadpool ducks low and continues into this big awesome shot here. And Deadpool says, you ain't found it yet because we ain't equals. And so Deadpool punches him in the guts and knocks him out. So... I guess, I, I, I don't know if you can punch somebody in the, I mean, it looks like it's right in the stomach. I mean, there's some questionable anatomy going on here, but at a glance, it reads, and I feel like this, it feels like a really good solid punch. Like, he's got his arm tucked up close under him for a solid, you know, heavy punch to the guts, as opposed to a big arm flailing out randomly like this. 
So I kind of believe that this is a really strong, intense punch that takes Shatterstar down. Now, Shatterstar is super badass warrior. He's got a hyper-advanced healing factor. How do you get knocked out from a punch to the guts? Honestly, it shouldn't matter. It's not the point. Um, I guess I would have thought a, like an uppercut to his jaw would have knocked him out. But I got to give it, I mean, these are all kind of terrible drawings and some really shitty, weird coloring. You know, weird anatomy. But I like this intense punch right there. I feel the power of it. So Deadpool takes off, says, okay, playtime's over. Don't know how long Liberace's going to be in Dreamland. I'm like, wasn't he just saying he was going to kill him? But then Deadpool says, no reason to kill today what I could beat up tomorrow. Oh, I mean, okay. At least they address it. So Deadpool goes running down the hallway. He says, so I better take care of business. And that means taking care of Domino. <clears throat> so then you got Domino just sitting in a chair in front of a computer. Pretty good high angle shot with intense lighting. And she's talking to herself. She says, Siren, Teresa Cassidy, Sonic Powers, just like her father, the X-Men Banshee. What she lacks in his knowledge and experience, she more than makes up for in passion and anger. Close file. Who's next? This shot of Banshee, that I'm almost 100% positive is a lift of a Jim Lee drawing from X X-Men 4 or something like that. Four or five, uh, Banshee had his jaw broken, and like I know that drawing. I remember from the instant I saw this issue. I'm not. I wasn't going to go dig out the comics. I've got them buried because I reviewed them so long ago, and I kind of put everything aside. I wasn't going to dig it out, but I am completely positive in shouting this out as he took a Jim Lee drawing here. The shadows and the shapes and the form maybe gave him a little bit more curly hair, but that is a lift from a Jim Lee drawing. Does it matter? I don't know. But it seems kind of unnecessary. Like, it's just a straight-on shot of a kind of standard, strong, muscular male face. Why do you need to lift a Jim Lee drawing when that should be one of the most basic things you should be able to do? But Domino sitting in the chair, Deadpool sneaking up behind her. This was an interesting composition. I don't know if it works well or fails, but... It's there's him like there's this little inset panel over where the computer monitor is being shut off as Deadpool reaches over her, clicks a button to turn it off and then grabs her with his other hand, pulling her the other direction. So as he clicks the button, shuts the monitor off and then grabs her. So it kind of works. It's not bad. It's 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 pretty ballsy. Um I wasn't ever confused, but it, it's you have to stop for a minute. You see him, and then you go here, but then click and okay, I get it. Um, so he says, "Oh, you forgot it so soon, did you, honey? Let me remind you, it's your old boyfriend, Deadpool, or it's your old boyfriend, Deadpool. So what should I call you, Vanessa or Domino?" And he smashes her head down on the computer panel there. Pretty violent. Always taking the opportunity to draw. Big sexy curved ass, even when the world's getting her, the, the woman's getting her ass beat. This Contra ad, man, that thing really stands out. Like, you can't help but stop and go, all right, we have one thing to say. Boom. I feel like it's a pretty effective ad as far as the lettering. Um, I never played that one, so I don't care. The only Contra I care about is the original Nintendo version. So, Domino. Kicks him right back in the nuts. She says, get out of here, Wade. He says, come on, darling. Is that any way to say hello? And then she says, you're going to ruin everything, Wade. Now, wait, wait, wait. Domino's been an integral part of the team, very much on our side. And it's implying that she's got a relationship with Deadpool. And she says, you're going to ruin everything. I have to question the choice of this shot. Um, It's... It's ballsy. Again, I appreciate Pacella for trying a different thing. Spread eagle shot of her legs as she jumps and dives over the chair. That he, you know, she kicks him in the nuts, so he sits in the chair. So she's leaping over it. I, I, I just I don't think it works. It's because it, it's 
front and center right on the page. And it just looks odd. But again, I appreciate that Pacella is trying something. So she takes off running. Um, Deadpool says, no, baby, you already did that when she says you're going to ruin everything. She says, the minute you took on this job and the second you started to care about it. So he says, I feel so nostalgic. She still quacks. <laughs> she still packs quite a kick. But she's just playing hard to get, stringing me along the stringing me stringing me along the way she is. What a tease! So he, you know, flicks his hand down and shoots a rope out, the wraps around her. I gotta say, I think this rope thing was introduced by Liefeld in one of the earliest Deadpool appearances, but I don't think it was a mainstay for the character. I very rarely did I see that ever utilized. I don't think it needs to be done because it almost becomes too much like Spider Man. But grabbed her leg, dropped her to the ground. He says, you screwed up, Vanessa. Mr. Tolliver ain't really happy right now. Why haven't you reported in for so long? What's going on here, woman? You've fallen for this, for all of this stupidity. you starting to give a hoot about Cable and his zit patrol. So as he gets closer on her, she throws her head up to give him like a headbutt into his face. Again, not, I don't, I think the idea is sound. Like he comes up behind her and she's standing up, getting closer and closer. And so she throws her head up to smack him in the head. But I don't know if this is the best drawn way to make that look represented visually. But that being said, I was never confused when I originally read it. So you could say it works, but it is a little odd looking. So headbutt to him, another kick to the head, takes off running again. He's like in the jaw again because uh, Deadpool got his jaw broken. I think it was X-Force number two. And he says, that's it, Vanessa. And then these shots of close-up on the eyes, they got to be really easy to do. When it's just little slits, a couple lines, black over here, red in there. I think he did that same thing back here. Yeah. Close-up on his eyes. It's one thing about a simple but effective mask he's wearing. But she takes off running. He catches up. Kind of not a bad shot of him jumping at her there. Kind of weird designy background thing. Uh, whatever. Grabs her by the foot. And then I don't know what this explosive energy going on around him is supposed to be represented of. Except that he throws her into a wall. So it's interesting. But what is going on? He's like, so talk to me, girl. And she's like, what do you want me to say, Wade? He says, I want you to tell me you ain't fallen for cable. This is still just a job for you. Again, not a bad drawing. Kind of a pretty good hand as he's wagging his finger at her. So again, fight continues. Um, she says, I can't tell you that. He says, then I can't help but bust up that pretty little face of yours some more. Even if it is someone else's face. So now we're implying like this is... There's some mystery going on with her. Why is Domino here? Why is she working for the bad guys? Maybe she's gotten soft and wanting to work with the good guys, and so now she's in trouble. Um, I have to point out, this, considering the anatomical musculature and figure drawing that Mark Pasella has been doing in this book, there's something about this that looks too good. I wonder if any of you sharp-eyed guys out there know what if this is a lift of something. It looks good, the figure. And Pacella, I just, I don't think that he's that good here yet. Kind of the bent knee there and the leg flexing forward. I could be wrong. Maybe he, maybe this is him. But I just feel like this is a lift from something else. But as a fight scene, looks pretty good. Kicks at her. She's kicking at him. Again, another shot that's, I kind of like that shot of him. Another weird smack and energy and this weird background kind of white background there and then a line for the ground. Just weird coloring choices all over the place. Um, that's a really weird, almost hard to decipher pose that uh, Deadpool's in there. Really strange. But I mean, it kind of, Gives you the impression that he's a very nimble, jumpy character like Spider-Man. So I guess it works. 
course, she gets mad. It's just page after page of kind of the same thing. Just to ex- keep exchanging kicks to the nuts. And um, there's a lot of energy and action in this one. Like a lot of power in that kick. Anger. Like it's almost like the fallout from this page. Like they're fighting here and then boom, she slugs him right in the dick. Screaming enough. So you'd think that's for all the energy that she's throwing into this kick and how much he's recoiling from it. He's just like, uh, she says, enough. He says, of me, no, babe, enough of you, enough of us. So he punches her, punches her, kicks her, just taking her out. Now, (laughs) just going back to the artistic drawing parts of this, just looking at this weird anatomy in this leg there. Like, the guy who drew this did not draw that. This looks like Pacella. This looks like him pulling from someone else. But energetic stuff, I mean, as a kid, um, like I said earlier, I was really into Liefeld, and I was really into this story. Once Liefeld left, left, I was kind of disappointed, and I did not like this artwork. I was really mad at it because it wasn't the same. Looking at it now, as I think you can tell, I've got some positive to say about it. I like it a little bit better. I mean, I think I like it a lot better than I used to. It's objectively poor as compared to some of the masters of the of the day you mean compare this to some john Busima or kirby but there's an energy and a kind of a new energetic youthful vibe going on in this kind of art style that clearly had an audience because everyone grabbed onto it so You know, as the story continues, Deadpool says, don't forget who you are, where you came from. You can dump on me if you want, but don't dump on Tolliver. That'd be a very bad mistake because you and I both know that when this gig is done, you're still Vanessa and you're still Tolliver property. And you know what happens when he loses what's rightfully his. So he's holding the knife and throws it into the ground to imply that if she fucks with them, she'll she'll die. Not a bad, this low angle shot, like we're almost like, bird or ground like worm's eye view here we're right on the ground level kind of looking up and there's a lot of weird perspectives that don't line up right here like on the ground this kind of works with her and then this background perspective of this technological wall going weird over here but then Deadpool himself we're almost just looking straight on at him rather than it should be like angled at a plane going away from us, going up like that, it still reads, you look at it, you're like, there he is standing tough, there she is on the ground. So I think if you're reading this comic as a kid for the first time, 10 minutes into it, and you're flipping through it, you read it, you don't look at the weirdness. Um, But it is really strange. (laughs) I always did, I, I didn't like, like this part of Deadpool looks okay. And his leg coming down. But then this little like dainty little foot coming here. Where it's kind of bent back. And it just kind of got his toes down. Doesn't work. I think he should have left that out. And just said the leg just went behind her. And it's covered. But having that little bent little foot there. Makes all the strength and power of the pose there. Just evaporate in this little bent little soft ass lower leg. Anyway he throws the knife into the ground. And then takes it with him. He pulls it back out. And says just consider this a friendly reminder. Don't make me come back to tell you again. Um, And a big intense angry face on her. I like these drawings right here. So much so that I can't help but wonder. Because I've seen several things that I feel like are lifts from somebody else. But this drawing of her on her uh, on her knees. And the shadows. The lighting on it. And the same thing with him. And this kind of like. It's almost kind of like a naturalistic, like, casual stance he's standing in. And the shadows on that figure, I think it looks pretty goddamn good. So, again, is it not him? Is it not Pacella? So, angry, screamy face, great. And then we're cutting back to the whole, what's his name? This guy, um, Bridge and Kane. They're still angry about X-Force and they've got to take them down. And there's a whole subplot with that going on. That's been going on for issues for on and on and on. Like solve this problem. Um, the drawings get a little bit weirder as far as like the finishing, the inking. They're doing that Liefeld thing where they've got no eyes. At least he doesn't. I guess he does there. 
in, you know, again, Pacella's doing some backgrounds. I can't make heads or tail of this top panel. I can't really tell what or where. And then this is a really silly drawing. It looks like you're sitting here trying to take a shit in this ridiculous outfit and this giant face of Kane behind him. Uh, they're basically just saying, hey, we got to form a team and take down X-Force. Are you ready? I'm ready because here's our new team, Weapon Prime. As a kid, I was excited for this because I thought Kane was cool. And for some reason, I thought his outfit was awesome. It absolutely is not. It's a ridiculous Liefeld, Liefeld bullshit design. And there's some big, I'm like, is that Wendigo from the Spider-Man comics? Or that uh, McFarlane did? But I think he's Yeti, in, and if that's anybody in the comics, I don't know. It's got like a freaking gold nose ring and a choker. And then this is Richter, because he's going to join up and start taking help take down his former teammates, because you got to have Richter in there, I guess. And this guy, I, I can't remember. I have the name Tiger Strike in mind. I could be wrong. I could be remembering that from something else. But for some reason, I thought that was an awesome design as a kid. It's ridiculous now. Oh, here's a white outfit with some black highlights and tiger stripes, stripes all over you. And I like Wendigo Yeti, whatever the fuck. He's got a little tarp hanging around his furry dick. Like McFarlane didn't do that when he did Wendigo in that Spider-Man comic. But yeah, as a kid, I thought this was kind of awesome. And it turns out, as I recall... Uh, to not be awesome at all. Meanwhile, mysteries abound. Tolliver, this bad guy who's been a, been a mysterious figure in the comics, and I don't know if we ever were, we ever did find out who he is. I mean, he just wears like a trench coat and like a ridiculous cap just to keep him mysterious. Who the hell is he? I don't think I care. But anyway, there's some disgusting, weird creature that's taking him down these stairs. Some girl's strung up and it's Domino. So there's a Domino here that's been captured and there's another one, Vanessa, in the book back here. And the implication is that she's been part of this team, the other one, the, the traitor. She's been part of the team for this whole time. So the Domino that we've known since her first appearance has been not the real one. Now this, in my opinion, fucked up the character because I kind of liked the character of Domino. I like this girl that comes along and supports Cable. She knows them. They've got a history. They're fucking in that tub in issue whatever it was, three, four. Um, she kind of had a sense of calm about her and she could kind of rein in Cable's ridiculousness. But it wasn't Domino at all. It was that Vanessa girl. So what's this character like? Now there's two of them. And the other one we've known is a bad guy. And we're going to be reintroduced to Domino and a whole new character. I feel like it was stupid. I mean, is it a mystery? Like, oh, dun, dun, dun. Great. There's this mysterious thing that happened. I think it just wastes time and effort and fucked everything up. And from this point on, I didn't care about Domino. And I still don't. It just kind of screwed everything up. But as far as mysteries go, I, I guess it was interesting. We, it caught us all off guard. Anyway, I didn't think I'd have 43 minutes of shit to talk about this book. I thought it'd be like a 12-minute video or something like that. But artistically, there's things that Pacell is doing that he he's getting better. And he, there's things he can do that Liefeld cannot. But he also didn't have that intangible indefinable quality that Liefeld had that made it work. So it's a really weird conundrum. Anyway, X-Force number 11. That's all I've got for now. Thank you for watching. See you next time.